Right. So welcome colleagues to video B in our tutorial orientation for AUI 4862. Right. So what we've looked at previously in video A, we were looking at the questions which were posed to the managing director by the internal auditor and then the response that he has given. So now the question, just to recap again, and so that I can then begin to give the response in the comments. Look at here. They're saying that the positions of chief executive officer and the chairperson of the board held by different people. The response from the director is not applicable. We do not consider it necessary to have a chairperson of the board. Director's meetings are controlled by me. Which tells me that, okay, now we want to give the comments, right? When I'm looking at this, all right, what is the typical comment um, that I can give, all right? So we are looking at, remember the comments, they are based on the response by the managing director. Let me take you back to the required, right? They're saying comment on the extent of clothing PTY limited's compliance with the recommendations of the King Report 4. Consider each of the responses. Meaning to say you have to address or comment on each one of the responses individually. So we, we, what I'm gonna do on this, I'm just gonna say response number one, right? And then I'm gonna give the comments. So let me give you just, uh, first of all, the typical approach that you should have used. I mean, that you could have used in a question like this, right? So number one, guys, you can quote, in fact, let me say state, right? The king for recommendation, that's number one, which will not give you a lot of marks in any case, but you needed to do that, okay? That's number one. You state the king for recommendation. Number two, all right, you apply the king for recommendation to the case. And that's where you're now stipulating whether this, uh, I mean, that's where you are motivating. Let me put it in brackets. This is now where you begin to motivate with different points. You motivate why there is or there is no, or let me say there's non-compliance to the King 4 report. I want you to look at the sequence of response here. So first of all, you state the recommendations of the King 4 report in regards to what has been, uh, I mean, to the in regards to the response that this person is giving, right? So if I'm looking at this, this has to do with um, the position of the chief executive officer and um, and the and the chairperson of the governing body. Right? What does the King Four report state concerning these two roles or responsibilities when it comes to an organization? What does the King Four state? So you stipulate the recommendation, the King Four, as your point of departure. Then the second thing you do, you begin to now comment or apply that recommendation to the scenario. This is now where you are evaluating as to whether there's compliance with the King for recommendations or not. But don't just simply say, yeah, there's no compliance to the King for report, and then you leave it like that. No, you need to explain to the lecturer, why are you saying there is no compliance to the King for report? After you've done that, all right. After you've done that, this is now an added, um, you know, argument that you can then put here. You, um, you can then add a corrective measure. Remember, your comments. It's not only about identifying the problem. As an auditor, you give the solution to the problem. So if you see that they are not complying to the King for recommendation, right? So what should they do so that there is compliance to the King 4 report? And why are you saying that they should do so? Why are you giving that recommendation? Why are you suggesting that perhaps in this case, the suggestion would be to say there has to be a separation of responsibilities between that of the CEO and the person who is to be chairing the board committee. 
these two responsibilities should be kept separate. In other words, there should be isolation of responsibility, right? Why are you saying that there should be isolation of these two responsibilities? In other words, you're saying they should not be performed by the same individual, right? Why are you saying that they should be kept separate? What are the benefits of doing so? So as you give a corrective measure, you also need to state the benefits they are. I don't know if I'm making sense, uh, colleagues. Am I making sense to you? It makes sense. Right. So this is like a, a typical, let me say standardized approach that one could have used. Standardized approach that one could have used. Because you, you want to try and make sure that your responses are systematic and they are making valid sense. Suppose you are not an auditor and you give this person to somebody who's not an auditor and you're explaining this to them. Will it make sense to that person? Such that if they go to the King 4 report, they will be able to see indeed that, oh yeah, these are the recommendations of the King 4. And oh, okay, this is why this person is saying this company is not complying to the recommendations of the King 4. Oh, this is now the reason why they are saying they should then correct it in this way. These are the benefits. This is how the organization would benefit from, you know, from complying with the recommendation of the king. Oh, okay, now I see. It makes sense. So I'm just trying to make it to be logical to you. As much as it should be logical to the lecturer when they are marking you. See. So you state the recommendation, apply the recommendation to the case where you give with motivations whether or not there's compliance to the king for, and then you add a corrective measure and state the benefits thereof. That's what you were supposed to do there. All right, now let's answer the question. So the, okay, so now I'm uh, answering the question, right? Because we are doing it response by response. So what does the King 4 uh, re re report stipulate when it comes to this? So here's what the King 4 report, and I'll show you from the audit notes as well. So the King 4 report recommends that the board should appoint an independent non-executive director as the chairman of the board. Okay, let me show it to you. You go to chapter number four, corporate governance, go to principle number eight. Principle number eight, in fact, together with principle seven, they talk about, in fact, yeah, I'm actually on the right principle, right? If you look here under principle eight, the King Four recommend, re recommendations regarding to the chairperson of the board. Here is what the King Four stipulates. The board should elect an what? An independent non-executive director as the what? As the chairperson. Now, that's part of the recommendation. I'm not done, okay? There's another part where they will talk about the chief executive officer in number four of the recommended practice. They say the chief executive officer, notice, should not be the chairperson. Uh -huh. This is what the King Four states. The chief executive officer should not be the chairperson, right? And then, of course, they explain in brackets to say the CEO cannot be categorized as a non-executive director. And a former CEO should not be elected as a chairperson until three complete years have passed since the CEO vacated his position. What I'm showing you right now, these are recommendations of the King 4 applicable to what we are looking at in this response. Does it make sense? Is it aligned to what we, we are having in the response, according to you guys? Yes, it is aligned privilege. It I is. I think it is aligned. Yeah. Now, from so, but just quoting the recommendation, like I said, it doesn't give you a lot of marks, right? What gives you a marks is now you commenting and, and then giving the corrective measures. So I want to start with the issue of appointing. All right. Um, I want to start. Okay, so here, okay, let me just copy and paste it as it is from the King 4 report anyways, just to save time. So we are saying, uh, but I'm, what I'm going to also do, I think for the interest of time, I might, I might have to discuss the other ones and not write them down for the interest of time, okay? So here you quote it like that. The board should elect an independent non-executive Director as the chairperson. Now you begin to then comment 
based on what is happening in the scenario. Okay. So here's what I would state. I would say that it appears that the managing director is performing both res the both responsibilities in the capacity of CEO and the chairperson to the governing body. Chairperson to the governing body. So when I'm saying chairperson to the governing board, I'm saying the chairperson to the board of directors, okay? So that's what is happening there. Now, what are the negatives that is associated to that? Um, by virtue of, uh, okay, so let me, let me not say by virtue of, but I can say something like, um, the chair, the, the 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 managing director is is an executive director, all right, to the entity, and as such, there is no compliance with the. King for recommendation as he is not eligible for appointment as the chairperson to the governing body. Why am I, why are we saying that he's not eligible as the chairperson to the governing body? He will not be independent, independent to carry out the duties of a chairperson of the board and ultimately, all right, ultimately his objectivity is on the line with regards to his assigned duties to the organization, okay? Let me try to make it big so that you can see it, okay? So I want you to look at the points that I'm putting here. So number one, we are stating the condition that is happening in the entity to say there's no compliance because what is happening is the managing director is performing the position of CEO and the, that of the chairperson. Why, how do we know that? Uh, we can see that um, he's the one that is adjourning all the director's meetings. That, that's, that's one of the things we can tell from that. And we can also see that the managing director is in an executive director position to the entity. And as such, there's no compliance with the King for recommendation as he's not eligible for appointment to perform that, um, you know, that in that capacity of chairperson, he will not be independent to carry out the duties of a chairperson of the board. And ultimately, his objectivity is on the line with regards to his assigned duties to the organization. Is it making sense? It's now, making sense. Right. We are not done. Remember what I told you? You need to add what? A corrective measure and state the benefits. Right? So what is the corrective measure? The managing director should not chair or should not be assigned as the chairperson to the governing body of Clothing PTY Limited, of Clothing because uh, we need to state also which entity are we dealing with of clothing PTY Limited. Okay. Uh, therefore, the organization or the direct, the board rather, the board should 
a point a suitable candidate who should be an independent non executive director to fill that position is it making sense hello are you drawing some sense in this colleagues yes yes it, it makes sense privilege yeah so this yeah, makes sense yeah so this so notice not uh, 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 in in the in the comments i've given there i've stated the king for recommendation i've applied the king for recommendation to the scenario how so by commenting if there's compliance or no compliance and motivating why there is no compliance if in a case where there's no compliance anyway and then i've also added a corrective measure and stating the benefits so the corrective measures this individual should not be assigned as the chairperson to the governing board of clothing PTY Limited. Therefore, the board should appoint a suitable candidate to fill in the position uh, of that. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, should be a so should appoint a suitable candidate who should be an independent non-executive director to fill that that position. Simple as that. And you get four marks just for doing this. Okay. Oh yes. Um. The another thing that I can also comment here to say, um, ultimately, okay, ultimately, right. Ultimately, uh, the position. Come on now. I'm declining and this person keeps calling. The position of CEO and that of the chairperson of the board should be isolated in order to achieve a positive and effective governance structure. That's it. So this is in a, like some sort of a conclusion that I could have put there, you know, to to that particular and as part of my comments in response to, um, I mean, in 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 conjunction to the response of the managing director, right. So, but for the other ones, what I'm gonna do, I'm not gonna be writing like what I've done here. I will be discussing them for the interest of, of time. Is it okay? For the interest it's of- It's okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, so- any other view? Maybe you might have a different view on what I've just, you know, stipulated. You're more than welcome to share your ideas as well. Uh, they could be of benefit to someone here as well. So if you've got a different angle, please don't be shy. You're more than welcome to, to give your input, your contribution. It's more than welcome. Okay. Right. Let's go to number two. Question number two. So the second question here to do with the number of directors. So the first one is, how many executive uh, directors, okay, um, how many, okay, the number of directors, how many executive directors that the, does the organization have? How many non-executive directors does the organization have? How many independent non-executive directors does the organization have? So notice that the response, the, the, the response from the managing director stipulated that there are five executive directors, two non-executive directors, and notice with regards to independent non-executive directors, they have none. Why? We don't consider that there's such a thing as independent non-executive director. 
if you are a director, you must be totally committed to the company and you can't be in, uh, in, in independent. All right. Um, there's a lot of things to, to, to write about this, this comment right here. But let me show you what the, the recommendations of the King 4 report um, you know, stipulate. So again, because we are looking at the composition of the board, it's still part and parcel of principle eight. Oh, sorry, what I was discussing concerning the chairperson, it's part of principle seven. It's part of uh, principle seven. But now what I'm about to show you, it's 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 much to do with um with principle number eight of the King Four report. So let's have a look at it. So principle eight talks about the composition of the board that the board should ensure that its arrangements for delegation within its own structures promote independent judgment. Do you see that? And assist with balance of what? Power and the effective discharge of duties. That's what the King 4 recommends. It recommends what? Independent judgment. But look at what this person is saying, especially about the independent non-executive directors. We don't consider that uh, there's such a thing as independent and executive director. If you're a director, you must be totally committed to the company and you can't be independent. Total non-compliance to the King for Report recommendation. Because the King for recommendation is stating something else this person is doing otherwise, but it's not just limited to that, okay? It's not just uh it's not just limited to that. Um I want us to 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 look at uh where is it now? I think I've passed it. Eh? Uh, it's, it should be in principle seven. I want to show you something on principle seven. Um, sorry, this thing is moving very fast. Uh, yeah, it should be somewhere over here. So this one talks about, um, so in principle seven, one of the other things that the King Four uh, recommends, it has to do with the composition of the, the board, right? So it stipulates here that uh, there should be, uh, okay, collective skills, knowledge and experience needed for the board to meet its responsibilities. But in the context of our question, that is not where the issue is. There should be appropriate mix, but look at this now. An appropriate mix of executive, non-executive and independent non-executive members. This is what the King 4 recommends. There has to be that category, okay? Um, all right. There's another part I'm looking for here uh, that talks about the balance. Okay, I think that, that is what I've already read for you guys. Um, okay, here it is. The board should have a majority of what? non-executive directors, the majority of whom should be independent. So this, this is another one that is applicable to the scenario that we are looking at. This is another relevant recommendation of the King 4 report. Now, if I go back to this, uh, to the case, all right, I, I've not stated all of them, but uh, I, I've, I've pointed those two for a reason, right? If you look at the number of executive directors, they've got five of them. Look at the non-executive directors, they only have two and they don't even have independent non-executive directors at all. All right. Now, what I want you to observe is, if I look at the condition, the response here in this entity, and what the King 4 is recommending in principle seven, they say the board should have a majority of non-executive directors, the majority of whom should be independent. Do we have that in this case scenario? That's my question to you. I don't see it being the case, right? Why? So there's not compliance to the King 4 report. Why is it the case? Because there is, uh, it appears that there is more executive directors than non-executive directors. And it also appears that there is no independent non-executive directors in Clothing PTY Limited. That's the, the part where you're commenting and motivating why there's non compliance. And then number, number, the other point that you could also state there, the majority of the non-executive directors should be independent, right? That's one of the principles, um, of, or rather the recommendation of the 
King 44, but it doesn't appear to be something that they are complying with, you see. So now, there's and then another thing that I can also point out is the fact that it appears that the managing director Bongani, right, does not really recognize stakeholders other than the shareholders. He is all about profit. He is all about about profit. Because if 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 you if you don't concede, if if it's all about the commitment to the organization, it means it's it's all about profitability. You are not concerned about other issues that could affect other role players. So it appears to me there's no stakeholder inclusivity whatsoever because whoever is supposed to be part of the entity should only be committed to the entity, but not considering that there are other role players that also need to be taken into consideration. I'm just thinking out loud when I'm just looking at this um, because to me, when, the, when, the, when, 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 when we don't consider that there's such a thing as independent and executive director, it also means that it follows to me that you are not considering other stakeholders, see, because there are other stakeholders to the entity that may not necessarily be in the gap uh, of um, directorship in the entity per se, but would be affected by the way the organization is is is, is performing, and if. Somebody is not independent. If something is going wrong that can affect an external stakeholder, they would not report on it. But if there is somebody who is independent, right, in the entity, in the director setup, they will be able to, to comment if something is not right. Why? Because they are considerate about other stakeholders that can be affected by this entity. You understand? But if they are not independent, they will not report if something is not being done right. You see? Then let's go to number three. Um, I'm just trying to push because of time. Number three, are board committees appointed by the directors? So we are talking about the audit committee who is appointing it, the remuneration who is appointing it, and other committees. Okay, look at this, the response. No, I appoint all committees to assist the board. So meaning to say this managing director appointed the audit committee. He also appointed the remuneration committee as well as other committees. <laughs> right. Uh, these are very interesting responses. And look at this. Uh, so the, the first response about appointment, because remember the question is saying, are board committees appointed by the directors? So the answer is to say, no, I appoint all the committees to assist the board. So this is the managing director's uh, role, according to, to him. Then what about the audit committee who is appointing it? He's saying, no, not necessarily as we have efficient internal audit department, which reports regularly to me. Okay. <laughs> which already tells me something, that the audit committee is not existing. They only have the internal audit um, department within the organization. And already by looking at this uh, condition, it already tells me that there's no dual reporting relationship in place. Hence, the internal audit division would not be effective enough to perform their, their duties. They will not be independent after all. There's no organizational independence for the internal audit division. That's what I'm seeing already. Okay. Now, then look at the other one, remuneration. So the remuneration, yes, a three-man committee consisting of myself, the director of human resources, and one of the non-executive directors. This is not compliant to the composition of the board committee. Um, principle eight, talking of uh, the different type of board committee. I'm going to show it to you now. Then, of course, then other committees. No, there are no other committees. Other standing committees are considered necessary. No other standing committees are considered necessary. If we need a committee for a specific task, task I appoint it and I chain it. So what is this person telling us? It's also telling us that he is the chairperson to the remuneration committee. He is the chairperson of the governing body of this organization. This is just total disaster when I'm looking at this. Now, let's, let's, let's unveil this. Um, from principle eight, because I want to talk about the appointment of board committees. We are supposed to appoint the different board board committees. Okay, so principle eight. There it is. The board should ensure that its arrangements for delegation within its own structures promote 
independent and as and and uh, independent judgment and assist with balance of power and effective discharge of his duties. All right. So uh, this is just the general recommendations. You know. Um, so the directors, of course, they are the ones who are supposed to um, the directors of the company, including the incorporating directors. They are the ones who are supposed to be appointing. You know the different board committees. All right. So it's not it's not a one person responsibility, so to speak. So I want to take you to the part where they're talking of the um, the the remuneration committee because I want you guys to see something here. Uh, let me see remuneration committee. You know the way they are squeezed here. Sometimes you can actually miss. Um, okay, this is risk governance. Yeah, this is um, remuneration. Okay, look at the composition. All members should be what? Non-executive. That's what the King for Recommendation stipulates regarding to the composition of the remuneration committee. If I look at this, uh, yes, the three main committee consisting of myself, the director of human resource and one of the non-executive director. What, do you, what can you guys say about the composition of the remuneration committee? That is in place against what is recommended by the King Four report. What what can you guys say there? You're more than welcome to comment. Let me finish reading what the King Four recommends, all of it in its entirety. So all members of the committee should be non-executive directors. The majority of the members should be independent non-executive directors. The chairperson of the committee should be a non-executive director. Chairperson of the board should not be the chairperson of the remuneration committee. Now, the remuneration committee, yes, three main committee consisting of myself, the director of human resources, and one of the non-executive directors. And I want to read this statement here. No other standing committees are considered necessary. If we need a committee for a specific task, what do I do? I appoint it and I chair it. So what this uh, managing director is telling us is that the remuneration committee, not only is he the member there, but is also chairing the remuneration committee, which is in um, non-adherence to the, to, the, to the King for recommendations, right? So I'm going to point out a few things uh, for you there, okay? Um, all right, looking at the... Um, state of the entity there, it's a private company. Do you agree with me? Because it's a PTY limited. It's ending with that um, suffix PTY limited, right? Now, with private companies, they are not necessarily obligated to appoint an audit committee as such. They can choose to, so they've got an option, you know, to, to appoint an audit committee if they want, but they are not mandated to do so, okay? They are not required to do so. So you, you can bring uh, an argument along those lines to say, okay, first of all, uh, th that is when you're talking about the audit committee, say, look, um, the entity is a private company, right? And it is not required to, to, to necessarily establish or to appoint an audit committee within its governance structure. But the King for recommends an audit committee to be appointed. That's what the King for recommends, right? So, but in this context, we are seeing that there is no audit committee in place. And I need to also add another comment there to say that the internal audit department should never be a substitute to the audit committee. So what am I telling you there? I'm giving you the corrective measure to what is happening there. Because here we are seeing that they see that the audit committee is not necessary. Why? Because they have an efficient internal audit department. So what this managing director is telling me is that the internal audit division appears to be a replacement to the audit committee here. That's what is happening. But it should not be like that. So the internal audit department should never be a substitute of the audit committee. Why? Because they play different responsibilities. What the audit committee does and what the internal audit uh, does do, they are not the same. They, they, these are different role players altogether. So the internal audit division should never be a replacement to, to the audit committee. All right. 
And another thing that you can also add as a comment, just in regards to the internal audit department, is that um, in as much as there is a positive contribution that the internal audit division gives to the entity, they appear to be no dual reporting relationship due to the absence of the audit committee, since the internal audit division is reporting both administratively and functionally to to the managing director. Does it make sense? Because if 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 ever we are reporting as the internal audit, remember there are two dual reporting relationships that should exist. One is um what is it is it, it's um what is it um functional reporting which happens to the board directly to the audit committee to be frank and then the other one is administrative reporting to the ceo but if we are reporting only to the managing director what does that tell you it means you are doing both administrative and functional reporting to that to that ceo all right i will have to leave the comments there due to the time constraints but guys this question was just so that i can give you a typical um you know um way by which you can approach an essay-based question in the context of an assignment and similarly in the context of an exam question i'm going to provide the solution i have the solution already uh, to this particular question so i'm going to give that to you as well just so that you can be able to go through the question again from a different light and also looking at the the solution now i just want to quickly come back to this just to explain the rest of the other administrative stuff. So in terms of portfolio package, I want to explain that 3,000. What does it involve? It's, it's for the full tutorial service package. So what it means is that it, it caters also for your assignments. You don't need to pay the these other amounts that are separate for, in, for, for other services. They are already incorporated in the 3,000 rents, and it's payable on a month-to-month -month basis. We spread it over a period of, of seven months. Okay? So it will be payable in monthly terms. That is if you choose uh, or if you decide to join the whereby we are doing classes on a week to week uh, basis. I think with that colleagues, I will leave it at that. And if you're interested to join uh, our tutorial services, you're more than welcome to reach us on our WhatsApp line. Thank you so much for your time. Any questions? But I, I think we are left